Let's start. So welcome everybody to our webinar today. Um, my name is Michelle. I'm the event coordinator for Savannah Institute, and we will be talking about ownership pathways in agroforestry. And just a quick uh, inter overview of Savannah Institute. The mission of Savannah Institute is to lay the groundwork for widespread agroforestry in the Midwest. We work in collaboration with farmers and scientists to develop perennial food and fodder crops within multifunctional polyculture systems that are grounded in ecology and inspired by the Savannah biome. The Savannah Institute strategically enacts this mission via research, education, and outreach. If you're interested in becoming more involved, our website has a plethora of information. Join us at our other webinars that we're hosting throughout the summer, and we're actually doing some in-person events, which you can find on our website. We also have a free book that you can download called Planting Tree Crops, uh, and there's a bunch of other resources on our website, so I encourage you to visit that. A few housekeeping items. Please mute yourselves during the presentation, and this will be available as a recording on our YouTube channel about a day or two after this. Please post your questions in the chat, and I will ask them to Patrick at the end. And without further ado, I'll introduce our business analyst, Patrick Michaels, who will be walking us through this webinar. Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'm excited to do this. Welcome to the webinar um, titled Ownership Pathways in Agroforestry. And that's, a, that's an expansive title. So we're gonna be talking today about partnerships, uh, both between landowners and agroforestry farmers and between the different elements of an agroforestry system. So between perennial crops, annual crops, uh, and livestock. And then we'll also, because we got ownership in the name, we're gonna be talking about land access uh, and both sort of, you know, long-term lease uh, terms that can provide uh, pathways to ownership and different ways to finance um, uh, land ownership. So. My name is Patrick Michaels. I am a, the business analyst uh, at the Savannah Institute. And uh, among other things, I create enterprise budgets and financial models for the different elements of an agroforestry system, and then look at integrating them together, uh, which is relevant to today's talk. So, um, so overview for today, we're gonna, I'm going to give you a few examples of partnerships that I'm going to kind of refer to throughout the throughout the webinar. Um, we're going to talk about why might you want to form a partnership, uh, the key elements of a partnership, uh, both in terms of you know things you've got to discuss and things that have to be uh, written up in contracts. Um, I'm going to talk about a few more examples uh, of of different types of partnerships that are out there already. Uh, we'll run through some numbers, particularly on looking at sort of rent dynamics uh, among multi-party uh, uh, leases, and then talk about buying the farm. And finally, I'll give you some links to a whole bunch of resources. This will, like Michelle said, be available afterwards. I think the presentation will be as well, so you can follow all these links from there. Oh. And a disclaimer, uh, I don't know if this is necessary, but this isn't any kind of official advice. So consult some official advice sources uh, before doing anything real. Uh, but this is some um, uh, um, places to start in your thinking and in your research. So the first example that I want to talk about is Allerton Park. Uh, this is in central Illinois. This is a Savannah Institute alley cropping demonstration farm. Uh, this is just put in last year. Um, it's about 25 or so acres. Uh, and you can see there are uh, rows of trees. Those are 30 foot wide uh, tree lanes with about 150 feet of uh, row cropping alleys in between. And so the structure here is there's a landowner. It's the University of Illinois. Um, and they have entered into a long-term lease with the Savannah Institute who then planted the trees here and subleases out the alleys to a farmer. The farmer in this case is the farmer that was farming this land just before this project got started. Um, and so there's a couple of elements of this really nice drone shot that I wanna uh, draw your attention to. Uh, one on the left side at the headlands there, you can see some lanes mowed down through the corn. Uh, and those are sort of some access lanes for 
uh, Savannah Institute staff to get to the tree rows for management. So that's like the kind of thing that needs to be in, uh, in, in the sublease contract, right? Is, well, we need some way to get into those internal rows. And so rather than, you know, unilaterally decide to mow down some corn each year, we're going to write in the contract, here's how it's going to work and we're going to agree to it up front. And that kind of systemic planning and getting it in writing is what's necessary uh, for a, a multi-party partnership to, to really work. Um, the other example that I'll be referring to is Vulcan Farm, also in central Illinois, and this is a silvopasture partnership. So, you know, there's three parties in this. There's the landowner who has entered into a long-term lease with the tree farmer. In this case, it's a 99-year lease. Um, and then the uh, animals are actually also owned by the landowner. So trees on your land um, to you know, provide shade for the livestock and maybe some uh, 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 you know, browsable uh, uh, foliage um, planted for, for the livestock. And so that sort of, you know, though there are three elements to the system, there's the land, the trees, and the livestock, there's only two parties involved. And so the lease kind of takes into account the fact that there is value going both ways um, or multiple ways uh, in this. So why form a partnership? So agroforestry um, thrives on sort of, you know, diverse cropping systems integrated together, uh, the dynamic tension of perennial crops, annual crops, livestock, uh, natural areas. Um, but it is hard to do every single bit of that by yourself. Um, so, you know, the skills and experience and access to markets that it takes to uh, raise livestock are very different from what it takes to plant and manage uh, perennial crops. And so a good way to accomplish this integration is through partnerships between different, um, different farmers doing different things integrated together on the same land. So from the different perspectives of a partnership, you know, who, what does each one of these uh, people want? So a landowner might uh, might want to pursue a long-term lease partnership structure, perhaps for profitability. They might think, you know, well, if I do a variable rate rent uh, uh, deal here, I might not get any rent for a few years, but maybe off in the future, if I think that, you know, perennial cropping systems are, uh, are, are the, the way of the future, that this might be a, a more profitable than just renting it out to corn forever. Um, they also may be interested in conservation, right? This is the case with a lot of, you know, absentee landowners, non-operating landowners uh, who want to see conservation practices implemented on their farm, uh, whether that's, you know, improving uh, uh, water quality or soil conservation or biodiversity or carbon sequestration. Uh, and, you know, you're going to get that more effectively, more dynamically, uh, more holistically through uh, agroforestry than through, you know, sort of various annual cropping practices. They may also be interested in this from an aesthetic perspective, right? Um, you know, this is, I, I think back a lot to, uh, um, I went and met with the landowner at Vulcan Farm, actually, uh, earlier this year. And one of the comments that she made about, you know, well, what do you like about, uh, about having implemented agroforestry on your farm uh, is that, um, you know, previously it had been just rented out for corn and it was just a bunch of identical corn plants in the sea of billions of corn plants uh, and essentially anonymous acres. Um, and now with trees and grazing and a windbreak and uh, uh, natural areas, uh, the farm is a place. And in fact, every little bit of the farm is its own place, uh, is existing uh, in a very specific way rather than just, you know, another spot that a, a corn plant might be popping out of. And so, you know, don't underestimate the, the value of that for a landowner that, that they may, you know, uh, uh, want to pursue these kind of non-standard long-term commitments because of aesthetic reasons, conservation reasons, etc. The final element for a landowner that's relevant for everyone else um, is the question of succession. Um, everyone has heard all of the statistics, you know, some huge fraction of land is going to change hands in the coming, you know, 10, 20 years. Uh, the average farmer's age is, you know, pushing 60. 
Um, so there's going to be a transition coming, and this is a question that's on a lot of landowners' minds, particularly those who are interested in conservation practices, who, who are not just looking to get, you know, top dollar corn rent uh, for their land, but want to consider themselves stewards of the land, who want to invest in the, uh, the future of that land and the future farmers of that land. A long-term lease sort of naturally begs the question of, you know, uh, or naturally raises the issue of succession. So if I'm a, you know, an older landowner entering into a 30 year lease or as in Vulcan Farm, a 99 year lease, this lease is intended to outlive me. It may even be intended to outlive the farmer, right? This is a, a very long-term thing we're talking about. And so, you know, this is a way to secure uh, some measure of, of, you know, stewardship and land ethic in the question of land succession. From the tree, a tree farmer's perspective or a perennial crop uh, farmer's perspective, uh, partnerships help with land access, right? Not just, um, uh, not just with, you know, needing the long-term lease and so needing to form some sort of partnership with a landowner in order to uh, uh, get access to the land. Uh, but also in reducing land costs or reducing net land costs. Um, the, you know, when you can take out a long-term lease and then sublease out bits of land to other farmers or to other farm operations, that helps buffer some of those initial, you know, initial years where you're not making any money on perennial crops. Um, and obviously you also get the ecological benefits from integrating livestock or integrating annual crops uh, into a perennial cropping system. Um, from an annual crop or livestock farmer's perspective, obviously it's also about land access. Um, part of this is that, you know, if there are going to be more and more perennial cropping systems on the landscape, not every, you know, row crop farmer wants to uh, integrate their system into, I mean, they don't want to be fiddling around with trees. Um, and so farmers that are, you know, are interested in farming between tree rows or farming in an integrated way, um, are, you know, going to have sort of a comparative advantage in getting access to that land. And obviously, for everyone involved, the ecological benefits, you know, uh, perennial crops, um, you know, are going to help with, you know, an integrated pest management strategy and are, you know, help with, uh, uh, you know, windbreaks and the like. So there's a lot of benefits for everyone to have multiple farming operations operating on the same land. So the key elements of a partnership, number one, communication. Um, the, you know, this is a relationship, particularly a long-term lease. You know, you're, if you're doing a 30-year lease, uh, communication is key to making this uh, work well. That's not just, um, you know, how do you like to communicate? You know, do you want to communicate by email or whatever? It's also, what are we communicating about? What kind of hard questions are we asking? Um, and, 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 you know, how open and honest are we going to be about what it is that we want, what our values are, what our long-term goals are. You know, it doesn't help to keep things private and secret uh, that are going to be relevant for the next 30 years. You know, you've just got to be open and upfront with it. And importantly, you've got to get it in writing. Uh, any lease longer than a year, you know, a, a, a one-year lease can be an or, a, a, just a, 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 an oral lease, right? You can just kind of have, have talked it through and it'll be, you know, the courts will say, okay, fine, we'll hold it for this year and then it's, it's off from then. Um, but if you are doing a long-term lease, you've got to get it in writing. And particularly in a, um, you know, multi-party system or a long-term lease, there's a lot of questions that are going to continue to come up again and again, right? What's the rent rate this year? What's the rent rate next year? What's the rent rate in 20 years? And you need to have in writing something more than we agree, right? Uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. It's got to be, okay, we agree now that this is the way that we're going to do it. Um, and other sorts of questions that you are going to want to bring up, you know, who's contributing what? The simplest form of this is landowner contributes access to land. You know, perennial crop farmer contributes knowledge, skill, time, expertise, money, you know, everything else. Or, you know, a, a landowner can also invest in some of the infrastructure, right? Can invest in fencing or irrigation, uh, can help finance uh, tree establishment. Um, you know, there's a variety of different uh, things necessary for an agroforestry system to come together, and they don't all have to 
you know, be on the farmer side. There can be sort of a, a, a dynamic uh, uh, relationship there. And relatedly, who owns what at the end of the day? This is a particular challenge when it comes to trees on leased land. You know, you, um, uh, you may be on, on leased land where the landowner owns the land and you own the trees, but now the lease ends and well, you're not taking the trees with you. Um, so, you know, sketching out what does that look like, you know, in some of the leases that we've seen, you know, if the lease is broken in some way, you know, the landowner has to pay some damages to the, uh, to the perennial crop farmer, um, recognizing that, well, I've, you know, I, the perennial crop farmer, have put a lot of uh, time, effort, and investment into this. Um, and, uh, um, you know, and, and it can't just be, you know, uh, swept away that easily. One uh, resource that I want to just draw your attention to right now that I'm going to be kind of leaning on throughout this presentation is the Agroforestry Long-Term Lease Workbook. This is a collaboration between Savannah Institute and Farm Commons, the farm legal nonprofit. Uh, this is a free PDF uh, available on the Savannah Institute website. I would highly recommend uh, uh, downloading it and reading it. It's, you know, 100 pages. It includes, you know, a whole bunch of uh, uh, really good kind of questions that you need to ask yourself um, or types of conversations to have among the members of a long-term lease. It includes a sample lease with commentary. It's really great. Um, you give your, I think you, you just have to give your email address to the Savannah Institute to get on the, uh, the, uh, um, the newsletter. Uh, so, but there's a bunch of great information there. So it's like a, a two for one. You get the PDF and access to the newsletter. So thinking about a long-term lease, what are the specific types of terms that we're going to want to consider? So the first one is the term of the lease. How long is it? And there's a lot of considerations that are going to come into play here. So the first one is going to be, what do I need as a, if I'm putting in perennial crops, what do I need relative to the kind of lifespan and maturity and yield, uh, yield curve of those crops. So if I'm putting in small fruits, right, that might start yielding in year three, uh, be hitting full uh, yield production in year five, uh, by year 10, you know, I've, uh, that investment may have paid for itself. It may continue to pr produce returns off into the future, but a 10 year lease might be enough for me to be comfortable uh, with, uh, you know, knowing that I'll get my, my investment back out uh, over the, the term of that lease. With something a little bit longer term, like chestnuts, right, where you don't even get your first chestnut for six or seven years, um, and, you know, you are just beginning to pay, just beginning to recoup your initial investment in the sort of, you know, 12 to 15 year time frame. You need, you don't, you can't do a five-year lease or a 10-year lease. You are going to need a 15-year lease. At, at least, you know, maybe even a 99 year lease. One of the issues with this is that a bunch of states in the Midwest have maximum lease terms, right? So uh, in Wisconsin, for instance, a lease cannot be uh, any longer than 15 years. Uh, in Iowa, 20 years, Minnesota, 21, you know, there's, there's a number of these. Uh, and these are, you know, uh, come from, you know, perhaps some like exploitative relationships in the past, right? Where a distressed farmer signs a long-term lease out of desperation uh, and sort of locks themselves into a, a contract that they don't want to be in. So, you know, that's sort of where this comes from. In Iowa, this is a, you know, part of the state constitution, right? It's not just a law. Um, and so I understand where those are coming from, but they are not necessarily ideal from an agroforestry perspective where we're talking you know, multi-decade uh, uh, um, investments. You're also going to want to think about how is the, how does this lease get renewed at the end of it. You can't make the renewal automatic, right? You can do that in a in a one year lease where like the next year is is an automatic renewal, but you can't do that with you know if you're hitting a, the maximum, the state maximum, a 15 year lease, and you say, well, we're going to automatically renew it for another 15 years at the end. That's a 30 year lease, right? Um, and so you can't, uh, you can't do that, but you can talk about, you know, what are the terms on which we're going to negotiate this, you know, bringing good faith to the, to the effort and all that. Another term to consider is the rental rate. There are two, uh, two standards for this. There's a fixed cash rent 
or there is a variable uh, crop share, revenue share uh, rent, or some sort of hybrid between, you know, reduced fixed rent with some opportunity for uh, participating in, in the revenue share for the landowner. Um, these work a certain way with annual crops, right, where it's sort of the landowner making a bet on, uh, on the crop yields of their land, um, sharing some of the risk and reward with the farmer. But they have sort of a different character in a long-term lease, right, where it may not be, you know, each year a risk and reward calculation, but it's a long-term, you know, if you do a fully variable lease, you might be paying nothing in rent for, you know, in the case of chestnuts, five, six, seven years, and quite a bit in rent in year 20, 30, 40. Um, and so it's more of a kind of long-term investment on the part of uh, on the part of the landowner to do a variable rent uh, setup in an agroforestry system. Secondly, there's the rent adjustment because it's all well and good to say, all right, two hundred dollars an acre. That's the rent today, but that might not be the rent in ten years or ninety-nine years for that matter. Um, so. And again, you can't just say, we'll agree in the future. We commit to agreeing because you might not, or the land might be sold to another party who you know, definitely doesn't agree with you. You've got to set your uh, rent adjustment calculation method uh, upfront. There's a lot of ways you can do this. It's, you know, it could be uh, you know, just a fixed annual percentage, you know, 2% higher each year. Uh, you can look at comparable uh, 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 rental rates in the area. You, know, you can pick an appraisal, um, all sorts of methods for this. Um, you know, one key here is you don't want to have this be based on, you know, the value of this property, because if you have put a bunch of perennial crops in, you have increased the value of the property, potentially. Um, and so you don't want to be sort of paying twice, once to put in the trees and then next to rent the land that is more valuable because it has trees on it. Um, so selecting that rent adjustment method, agreeing to it now up front is key. There can be a bunch of restrictions and commitments that either party can put into a long-term lease, right? A lot of these might be like, you've got to do it organic uh, or, you know, no, no uh, herbicides uh, or, you know, you'll, uh, uh, you won't put trees in this area, right? There might be various uh, restrictions there's as many uh, uh, situations there as there are farming situations. And so there's not really any standard, um, standard restrictions and commitments that you're gonna find. And finally, and kind of most relevant for our, um, our discussion today is having a path to ownership as part of the long-term lease, right? If you have a 15 year lease and then it's over and you maybe don't have a chance to, uh, um, to, to continue leasing it, but you've got all your trees there, that's a tricky situation to be in. And so having some sort of purchase option or right of first refusal, uh, a term like that, which we'll talk about later uh, in this, is a really important part of a long-term lease, particularly for the way in which agroforestry can be a path towards land ownership, right? You begin your operation just in a lease, you are using profits to reinvest in the business, building working capital, building equity in your business and building markets, having the trees mature and you know, uh, increasing production. And then 15 years later, once you are in a much stronger financial position, uh, once you have a, a, a solid uh, business history behind you, you now are in a much stronger position to actually buy that land uh, out from under the trees, you know, using the trees to buy the land out from under them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So what about farm partnerships, not just between the landowner and the farmer, but among the farmers themselves? Um, there's a lot of considerations uh, here as well. Uh, as I mentioned in that, um, in that, in the discussion of Allerton Park, uh, system design is an important piece of this. Um, so in, in that case, you know, the, the tree rows were 30 feet wide, right? Three rows of trees uh, per uh, tree lane um, and about 150 feet of, uh, of alley in between. Why 150? Why not 100 or 50 or, or something else? Well, the farmer's equipment size 
and the standard equipment size in that area was 30 feet. And so the alley width needed to be a multiple of 30 feet uh, so that this wasn't, you know, well, I'm renting the alleys, but I can't farm 10 feet of it because it wasn't sized correctly. And, you know, you might get into some arguments about that. Um, so sizing the different elements of an agroforestry system in, that in a way that enables uh, cooperation and partnership in the future rather than inhibiting it is an important part of the upfront system design element of this. Um, you know, when you plant trees, you are in some ways greatly reducing the flexibility of that land, right? It's not just a blank slate anymore. It has a bunch of fixed points. But at the same time, you are greatly increasing the scope of, uh, of uh, you know, flexibility and diversity that you have by having points around which to integrate other elements, right? It's not just a blank slate. It, everything is now in relationship to each other. Those crop interactions in particular are something to consider in, in upfront system design. Going back to that Allerton example, those are really widely spaced tree lanes, right? 150 feet between. When those trees are fully mature, they're not going to be shading out the middle of those lanes. They might be interacting with, you know, the, the, um, the crops just next to the trees, right? Competing with, uh, for, you know, sunlight, water, nutrients. Um, but in the middle, you know, there's not going to be much in the way of crop interaction there. In a more intensive system with more tightly spaced uh, tree rows, uh, those crop interactions are going to be very significant over time, right? You might have very significant shading effects uh, between your now mature chestnut trees and whatever you're hoping to grow in the alleys in between. Rather than growing, you know, summer annuals, you might have to switch to winter annuals, which are not as profitable and so might require you to accept a lower rental rate. Uh, or maybe, you know, certain vegetables can or cannot be farmed uh, when there's a lot of shade. So there's a lot of considerations there, particularly through time, not just right up front, but what's this all going to look like 30 years from now? How is that, uh, uh, how are those interactions going to help or hinder uh, collaboration and partnership? Another key piece of this is access. This is about physical access, like in Allerton, those access lanes. Uh, and these should be written down in the contract, right? This is, uh, you know, not something we'll just figure out particularly when you're talking about animals, right? There's going to be areas the animals are allowed to be and cannot be. Uh, areas where fencing, where you know, more permanent fencing and more temporary fencing is going to be. There's also questions about you know, visitors to the farm. If somebody wants to do an on-site farm stand in a couple of years, is that okay? Uh, you know, when, are, when are people allowed to come on the farm uh, or not? You know, if you are the tree farmer, you might you know, have a window around harvest that you don't want just anyone showing up, uh, you know, like, and so having that sort of restriction in writing is important. There's some other um, uh, restrictions and commitments that you might include in a farm partnership. So again, in the Allerton example, um, part of the contract is, all right, you can't use this herbicide, that herbicide, and that herbicide at all because they're very damaging to the trees and there's too much risk there. And you, know, you can only spray herbicides other than those when the wind speed is below this. And you know, there's a variety of terms that you would put in there that the farmer is going to have to agree to because he, he is now farming in a way that is integrated in with trees. And it's not just another acre of corn somewhere in central Illinois. Another piece of this between animals and crops is you know, sort of food safety concerns. So, you know, you, particularly if you're organic, um, you know, you can't have animals grazing under the trees that you're going to harvest within some window. And so making sure that the, uh, the way that the livestock farmer is operating is recognizing that and conducive to that so that you're not kind of running into some food safety issue in the future is the type of restriction or commitment that you would want to include in that kind of partnership contract. Uh, finally, you know, there's the issue of infrastructure. So, um, you know, who's putting up the fencing? Who's paying for it? Who owns it? Who's maintaining it? Um, you know, who's putting up, if it's a veggie farm that's integrated into the perennial crops, you know, 
who's putting up the pack shed, who's, who's putting in the irrigation infrastructure, who's paying for this, what kind of access do they have to it? Um, you know, these are all important questions to answer. So a few examples um, that I want to sort of call your attention to, these are all links that you can uh, learn more about each of them. So the first three, Prairie Wind Farm, Southern Ohio Chestnut Company, and All Grass Farms, are all long-term lease situations on public land or land trust land or sort of somehow, uh, uh, you know, land that is not, uh, you know, eventually there's no purchase option at the end of it necessarily. <coughs> um, this is a, a partnership between a land trust or a forest preserve or something like that that wants to have interesting agriculture happening uh, in, in that system. Uh, and so there's a variety of you know, restrictions that might, uh, that might be on these farms based on the fact that they, you know, prairie wind farm is sort of integrated into a housing development and uh, Southern Ohio Chestnut Company is part of a forest preserve. And so there might be various restrictions on them um, but they're willing to abide by them. They might, may not be relevant restrictions to their farming practices. Sharing our roots. This is, I think, formerly the Main Street Project. This is a collaboration among, uh, uh, you know, a variety of landowners, public landowners, kind of a farm incubator, integrating in, you know, small vegetable farms, perennial crops, uh, 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 poultry grazing. Uh, really an interesting uh, uh, system that I would encourage you to check out. Agrarian Trust and their uh, project, the Agrarian Commons. Um, this is a, a great organization that's, you know, a land trust that owns land or gets access to land and then tries to integrate together multi-party um, uh, agricultural systems. Um, and they've got a, a number of examples spread throughout the country and are kind of continually growing in that regard. Um, this is, to my mind at least, the, the wave of the future in agriculture, right? This sort of uh, multi-party integrated agriculture producing actual food. Um, you know, this, this is something that is happening more and more and will continue to be. So keep your eye out for more examples of this and more ways to get involved uh, in those types of systems. So let's talk about some numbers. So these are just some kind of, you know, hypothetical-ish numbers uh, just to illustrate some points. So the first is that the rent dynamics change over time. So let's look at this top table here. Uh, we've got a landowner on the right. They have 100 acres uh, and they want to rent it out for $200 an acre, uh, $20,000 per year. And they have entered into a long-term lease with a tree farmer. Um, and the tree farmer has planted 25 of those acres probably, you know, in an, ag in an alley cropping type setting uh, to, uh, uh, let's say, chestnuts. Um, and so they're going to pay, pay rent on, on their portion of it. Well, really, they're paying rent on the full portion of it. Um, and they're subleasing out the alleys, the remaining 75 acres, to a, uh, a row crop farmer. And so in this case, you know, right at the beginning, when the trees are just, you know, uh, sticks coming out of the ground and are not in any way interfering with, uh, with the farming operations in the alleys, you can still get $200 an acre for that, uh, that land renting it out to row crops. And so in this case, you've got 75% of the land is farmed by the alley farmer. They're paying 75% of the rent uh, to, and the tree farmer's paying 25% of the rent. Years later, however, the situation has changed a little bit. So the landowner still wanted to get $200 an acre, and we'll, we'll ignore the fact that, you know, the rent adjustment clearly has, has made this number different. This is, you know, today's dollars and today's dollars. Um, and at this time, the, uh, the trees are beginning to shade out and compete with the alleys. And so now instead of growing corn, the alley farmer is going to do winter annuals that, you know, can kind of do some seasonal sunlight arbitrage. Uh, where they're growing in the spring before the trees have really leafed out. Um, and so, you know, because wheat is a, a, you know, a lower profitability crop, this is now going to fetch a lower rental rate, right? It's going to fetch $150 an acre instead of $200 an acre. This might not be a long-term lease where this was defined up front. This might just be a series of annual leases where, 
you know, the, the agreement with the farmer kind of gets updated each year. And at some point it's like, ah, man, I'm just not getting the same yield that I used to. Like I got to drop, I, I need, I need a lower rent. And the tree farmer says, okay, okay, I get it. I was expecting this at some point. And so now the alley farmer is still renting their 75 acres at a lower rent. And the tree farmer needs to come up with the difference. And so now instead of the tree farmer effectively paying $200 an acre for their 25 acres, they're paying $350 an acre to make up for the fact that the alleys are not sort of quote unquote worth as much. Um, and so you can see how over time, uh, uh, the particular, you know, both the alley farmer and the tree farmer are going to change the relative amount that they're paying in rent if the landowner is wanting a fixed rent at the end of the day. The variable rent, however, allows the parties to sort of share the risk, share the reward, and sort of adjust, uh, uh, adjust the relative rent payments throughout the year, or throughout the years, rather. So here's sort of a situation, again, 100 acres, $200 an acre uh, rental rate. And the landowner has gone, gone into a long-term lease with the tree farmer where they are getting a 10% revenue share from the tree farmer. And the tree farmer themselves, uh, this one's a little bit uh, uh, complicated. Uh, may, maybe this is two, two different rental arrangements or, or something like that. Um, but the, you know, so the, the alley farmer is doing a 20% revenue share, making $1,000 an acre. So they're coming out as they were before to $200 an acre. So they're paying $15,000 in rent. The tree farmer could just be pocketing that $15,000. This could be part of their, um, you know, their ongoing cash flow for maintaining the trees. And they're paying, you know, 0% uh, or $0, 10% of nothing on their yield to the landowner, or maybe the, the, uh, a higher level lease was structured in such a way that it's, you know, a certain percentage of the, uh, of, of the perennial crop yields and a certain percentage of the alley crop yields. And so the landowner gets that, that $15,000. So in the early years, the landowner getting nothing from the trees and uh, a standard rate from the alleys is getting about 75% of what they were getting before. Years later, the alleys are again less productive, now returning $150 an acre, but the trees are now in full swing. Maybe they're making $5,000 an acre. You know, they're, it's a great chestnut year and solid markets. Um, and so the tree farmer is now paying an even higher rental rate, right? $500 per acre at the time that they're making a lot of money and they didn't have to, to uh, uh, pay any rent in those early years. The landowner in this case is not just sort of made whole as they were in the fixed rent example before, uh, but they're actually coming out ahead. And so this is sort of the, you know, the way in which that initial investment, so to speak, by the landowner of accepting a lower rental rate up front can then come back to them in the form of increased rent in the future. Here's a little graph that tries to show this. Um, so the brown line is sort of fixed rent throughout the year. You know, it's 100% of what you were expecting. The dark green one is a fully variable with the subleasing happening as well. Um, and so you can see it's, you know, about 75% as much for the first however many years, and then the yield starts to pick up and the, the landowner, um, you know, does, there, there's a lot more rent going to the landowner in the later years than there was in the early years. The blue line is sort of a 50-50 hybrid, right? Where you're paying, paying some amount in cash with a lower percentage of revenue share. The reason this kind of bumps up and down uh, in those, you know, kind of year 13 to 25 uh, is because, you know, at some point you need to thin the trees. You need to take a bunch of them out because otherwise they're going to kind of impinge upon each other's growth. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that it starts to happen, like, just as they're beginning to really yield, you know, you're tempted to sort of say, oh, can I, can I keep them around for five more years, you know, and sort of ride out this, you know, newly kind of high yielding period. Um, but it is sort of bad for the long-term development and long-term profitability of the, of a perennial cropping system. So you do need to sort of start thinning them out. Uh, there's also in here, you know, it's not, though the, though the trees may be continually uh, impacting 
the alley crop yields each year, right? Maybe a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. You're not going to necessarily be slightly changing the sublease rental rate every year. It might be more, you know, it's kind of the fixed standard amount. Of, and then at some point there's a, a moment where it drops a bit and, you know, uh, and so it might be more discontinuous in that way. Um, now you might show something like this to a landowner as part of the pitch, right? Like, well, why should you do, uh, uh, why should you rent to me? Why should you do, uh, you know, accept less money upfront when I'm just getting started? You know, look, look at, you know, how, how good it could be for you. And they could say, well, you know, that sounds awfully optimistic. Um, you know, and so maybe you, you know, do another presentation that's like, well, what if I only get 50% as much as I thought I was going to get in terms of yield or pricing? Um, and so you can sort of, you know, play around with what the numbers are going to be uh, and sort of show in a variety of different scenarios uh, what the, um, what a landowner might expect, what you as the perennial crop farmer might expect. Um, this is all going to be, I don't think it's available right now, but in the coming months, check the Savannah Institute newsletter. Uh, some of these enterprise budgets that you can play around with um, are going to become available uh, on the website. Um, now, one thing that you may have noticed here is that for those first six or seven years in the variable rent, fully variable rent situation, uh, the landowner's not getting zero dollars, they're getting something, right? And that's coming from the sublease. And so this is the way in which partnerships really help help make this happen. You know, if you were renting land, putting in perennial crops, not doing anything in between, and just waiting, 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 there it's a lot more difference between what the what the landowner could have expected uh, from you know just renting it out for corn and what they actually got from you uh, over that time. And so the uh, um, the having a partnership, having something happening integrated within the system to helps buffer the kind of long time lag to maturity, long time lag to profitability uh, that happens in a perennial cropping system and makes it a more palatable uh, option for landowners and certainly a more palatable option for the perennial crop farmer, right? Rather than just being out full rent, rental rate or having to try to get a landowner who is interested in not getting any money for seven years on their land, um, they can now sort of, you know, integrate integrate these together, and it it really is sort of a win 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 system. All right, so let's talk a little bit about land access. So this is an important part of a long term lease, uh, to my mind at least, right? you're doing a 15 year lease on crops that are gonna be productive for 50 years, you want the option, the opportunity to buy that land at the end of the lease. You're gonna, as I said before, you're gonna be in a much stronger financial position um, and, <coughs> and, uh, um, and so setting up some sort of option to buy at the end of the lease or at some point during the lease is important. There's a couple of different uh, ways that this can happen and I'll go through these one by one. So, the purchase option. Um, this one is sort of the most favorable to the farmer or to the to the the, the lessee. Um, the the way that a purchase option works is right here at the beginning when we're signing the lease. We say, "I, the farmer, have the option if I so choose, the unilateral option, to buy this land at some point in the future, and we're going to today fix a price." or fix a method for arriving at that price, right? So it might be, you know, the average land value in the county, or it might be, you know, average land rents, um, you know, oh, assuming that, you know, the rent is 5% of the land value. Um, or it might be, you know, let's get an appraisal. But again, let's get an appraisal without the mature perennial crops on the land, right? What if it was just corn, you know, what would this land appraise for? Um, or we can just fix a number right now. And, uh, and so we set in stone in the lease up front, I have the option to buy this land at this price if I so choose, and you don't get to say no in the future. Or if you sell the land out from under me and there's a new owner, I still have this option at the end of the lease. Another element of the purchase option is when when do you get to exercise that option, right? Is it at any time or is it maybe 
when the lease is over, right? In the last year of the lease, you have the option to, to, to buy it. Is it, you know, not for the first 10 years, but then, you know, at any time after that, you give six months notice that you want to and you begin the process. Or it could be um, after some event, right? Some event happens and now you have the option to, now your, your purchase option becomes live. One specific example of that, uh, a common example is the death of the current owner, right? That might be part of the way in which this was a succession planning exercise, right? All right, maybe maybe the landowner lives lives on the farm and wants to live there for the rest of their days, but when they die, at that point, you now have the option to buy from you know the estate or trust or you know, whatever the uh, whatever legal structure was put into. Uh, a less um, a slightly less favorable to the tenant uh, option is the right of first refusal. So this is if the landowner decides to sell or decides to sell or receives an unsolicited offer that they are entertaining, um, the tenant has the option to match that offer, right? So somebody says, okay, it's, you know, I want to sell the land and I got an offer for $500,000. You know, you have now 180 days to match that offer if you want, and I have to take your match if you, if you come up with it. Um, you know, I can't, I can't say, oh, no, I actually do want to go with these other people instead. You have the ability to kind of take or refuse another offer that was given on that land. Another option is the right of first offer, which is, I think, even a little bit less favorable to the tenant, where if the landowner decides to sell, uh, you, are, you have the ability to propose, a, to make an offer, and they can accept or reject it. Um, if they reject it, they can't accept the same or less of an offer from someone else, um, but they can accept a higher offer. So you're kind of having to like guess and negotiate against yourself and negotiate against uh, uh, other um, other potential buyers, uh, which makes that sort of a you know a little bit more unfavorable. Uh, finally, there's sort of this lease to own situation, which is kind of like a purchase option, right? You're in a lease and you have the opportunity to buy the farm at the end. If you do buy the farm at the end, depending on how the lease to own language was written. Um, perhaps some percentage of all of the lease payments that you made from the beginning of the lease until now count as part of the principal payment. So, okay, I paid $100,000 of lease payments over the last 10 years, and you know, 40,000 of that is gonna count as, as part of my down payment, right? As, as already having been made. Um, and so that's sort of a modification of the purchase option. That's a, a good one to try to, um, to work in there. If you don't end up buying it, none of those, you don't have your little slice of equity uh, in there. It was only if you did in fact end up buying the farm that those lease payments retroactively are considered to be a partial payment of the, uh, of the principal. All right, a couple financing options, which are probably familiar to most. We'll breeze through some of them. So bank loan is the standard one. This is how most land gets purchased. It's a very hard one to do if you are a beginning farmer, if you don't have any equity, you need a 20% down payment or higher. Um, so if you're looking at a $500,000 farm, you know, not everyone's got $100,000 sitting in their bank account or can scrounge together $100,000 from friends and family. This makes it hard to get a bank loan for a lot of people. There's going to be an interest rate. Today, interest rates are low. They may be increasing in the future. They're probably going to be fixed for the term of the loan. Um, you've got an amortization period. So this is, you know, a 30-year amortization period means you're going to pay off the loan over 30 years. So sort of, but not really. It's like paying 1 30th of the principal balance each year with a little bit of interest on top of it. It's not actually how it works, but kind of conceptually, um, that's right. And then there's the term of the loan, which is often going to be shorter than the amortization period. So if the amortization period is 30 years and the term is 10 years, after 10 years, you're going to have paid off about a third of the principal. And the bank says, okay, that contract's over. Now you need to pay us all of the rest back or, which can, or refinance it through us. Basically, the bank doesn't want to 
you know, loan out money at fixed interest rates from years and years and years ago when the interest rate environment may have changed greatly. So they want an opportunity to reset the, uh, the interest rate. Um, other requirements from a bank, often gonna be personal guarantees, which are onerous and perhaps, you know, not even possible. Uh, and you're also gonna need a written business plan. Uh, the FSA, Farm Service Agency, I think, uh, has a bunch of programs available. There's a link down here to uh, um, help beginning farmers buy farms. There's restrictions on these. There's a lot of, there might be fees and a bunch of hoops to jump through. So they're not very easy to get, but I'd highly recommend checking out each of these. Um, they do direct farm loans. They guarantee your loan to the bank. They kind of act as the guarantor and let the, the bank kind of take a bigger risk than they otherwise would have. Um, the down payment program, which is part of this beginning farmer and rancher program, uh, or related to it, is, a, is one where you only have to put 5% down. Then the FSA puts 45%, gives you a 45% of the value loan, and a commercial bank does the remaining 50%. Uh, the FSA charges a very low interest rate and has some pretty easy terms for that. Uh, and so rather than putting $100,000 down on your $500,000 farm, you only have to put $25,000 down, which is a lot more achievable um, for, for a lot more people. Another option here is seller financing. So this is like super flexible financing because there's, it's not a, you know, boring conservative bank that doesn't like risk and wants to do it the same way every time. Um, so this is rather than you borrowing money from a bank and giving it all to the seller, the seller walks away having gotten all their money and now you have a relationship with the bank, you are paying the seller over time. So you can have no down payment or a standard down payment. Um, interest rates are often lower because the seller does not have uh, any like bank overhead that they need to pay. They don't have to pay out interest on deposits. There's none of that stuff so they can charge lower interest. Um, there's often an amortization period similar to uh, a traditional loan. The term is often gonna be shorter you know, five or 10 years, and you're not gonna refinance it with the seller, right? This is like, I'll give you five years to build up some equity. You know, the seller will give you five years to build up some equity in the farm. And, uh, um, and then you've gotta, you know, find a bank to, um, to take over the rest of this, of the loan. The alternative that you might hear about is the land contract, which to my mind, from a buyer's perspective is just a strictly worse version of seller financing. They basically operate the same with one key difference, which is in seller financing, from day one, you own the farm. In the land contract, the seller continues to own the farm until the last payment is made. And so if you stop paying, right, if you can't make your payments, well, you never owned it to begin with. And so there's not really any repossession that needs to happen or anything like that with the land contract. In seller financing, they might need to sue you and go through a whole process. but. If you're putting perennial crops in and doing long-term investments, I think you want seller financing instead of the land contract. But obviously some landowners are gonna want the land contract. There's also a bunch of alternative uh, methods popping up, uh, which I think a lot of people have heard about most of these. So Iroquois Valley, Dirt Capital, these are uh, kind of investment uh, uh, funds that buy agricultural land in partnership with a farmer and do you know some, uh, 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 long-term lease structure with an option to buy, you know, it's sort of kind of what we've been talking about, but in a little bit more institutional of a way. Steward is an example of a crowdfunding, ag agriculture crowdfunding uh, uh, resource. Uh, a lot of it's like crowdfunding infrastructure improvements, you know, oh, I need a new pack shed to improve my, you know, uh, vegetable farm profitability. I'm going to raise you know, $70,000 through crowdfunding, but they also do some land uh, purchases as well. Um, land trusts, as we talked about, are a, a solid uh, a way to get access to land. Um, there's not many of these, or at least not as much as we would all like, but I think that they're in, certainly increasing in, uh, in number and qu in quantity and uh, number of deals that they do. Conservation easements are an interesting way to help finance a deal. Um, you know, this is basically, you know, somebody <clears throat> sells the development rights of a farm. 
somebody buys it from them or they get a tax break or something like that. And it drops the land value and makes it easier for a farmer to buy, right? Uh, rather than, you know, potential development land, it's just going to be farmland. The current owner gets some kind of tax break or payment and then can sell it for less. And finally, and this is, uh, you know, some of the interesting stuff that's beginning to happen here, um, is group purchases, right? So it's not just a bunch of, uh, you know, stoic individual farmers out making it uh, on their own, but like, you know, and it's not just a multi-party lease system, but multiple types of operations coming together in an integrated way to sort of punch above their weight in terms of land access, to present a, a unified, united front uh, to a, a potential seller uh, and kind of putting together a, a solid business plan among them, right? And maybe creating a, uh, you know, LLC among the different farm operations. This stuff's just beginning to happen. Um, and so I would highly, you know, keep your ear to the ground on that. One last bit. This is something that's going to be coming out of the Savannah Institute in the coming months. Uh, we've got Monica Shea, a researcher here, putting together these crop suitability. Um, so this is an example for chestnuts where they go through and look at like all the different uh, um, factors that influence whether or not chestnuts are going to grow well. So how cold does it get? What's the soil type? How much rain is there? Um, and then make a map based on publicly available data to show where is what where are chestnuts going to grow well? Where are they going to grow poorly? And so this is maybe how you might pick where to look for farmland, right? Because in particular, you know, you often hear agroforestry is good on marginal land, but that's not really true. You know, you want your chestnuts to be on the best chestnut land possible. It just so happens that that may not overlap perfectly with the best corn land. And so you may be able to get some sort of crop arbitrage between land that's not that great for traditional row crops, but it's actually really good for the types of crops that you want to do and is therefore available for a price lower than its value may be to you. Um, look for these coming out. They're doing, you know, a, a handful of crops, you know, chestnuts, apples, pecans, elderberry, a whole bunch of things. Um, and so that might, is a, a good way to sort of find, uh, find properties that you might want to rent and eventually own. Um, just going to breeze through some resources. These are all available uh, as links afterwards. So the long-term lease workbook, Savannah Institute's got these land access spotlights that are really uh, kind of engaging stories about specific partnership situations, land access situations, um, and landowner spotlights, you know, landowners who got involved in agroforestry. There's a whole bunch of them. I'd highly recommend reading them. Here's a bunch of resources. Some of these are, you know, fractal, uh, you know, lists of resources within this list of resource resources. So there's, you know, months worth of reading uh, contained in here. Um, the bottom one here, the land connection, is something that's, again, just starting up. More of these are going to be coming online, I think, in the future. This is like a connection between landowners and farmers. You know, hey, I've got some land. I want conservation stuff done on it. Who want, you know, who's interested? I think it's in Northern Illinois right now, expanding to the whole state. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were examples of this um, throughout the Midwest and throughout the country in the future. So these links will all be available uh, afterwards and go check them out. A couple of future SI things. Um, the conference coming up, North American Agroforestry Conference, uh, the end of the month, beginning of next month, there's a whole series of plenary talks on land access on July 1st. So register for that if you would like to get access to those. Um, we're gonna be publishing a report on land access, incubators, et cetera, that it's probably really relevant to this discussion uh, in spring 2022. Uh, future webinar, date TBD, um, involving a specific project uh, that, um, that is sort of like this, you know, land trust has land, uh, wants it to be done farmed in a, a conservation-minded way, you know, goes enters into a long-term lease structure. I'm 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 personally looking forward to to that. And like I said a couple times earlier, sign up for the newsletter. Um, occasionally, there's you know some opportunities referenced in there, and these partnership enterprise budgets are going to be coming soon. Um, I have probably gone too long, and so I'm going to stop here and open it up for questions. That was amazing. Thank you, Patrick.
Does anyone have any questions? I haven't seen any come through on the chat, but please put them in there. We have a couple minutes. Otherwise, um, Patrick, is it okay if people email you or how, how do they get their questions answered? Yes, you can email me. It's patrick at savannahinstitute.org. Uh, it's on the front, front uh, slide of this. I'm happy to answer any questions or hop on the phone to uh, uh, chew through an interesting thing if anyone's interested in that. So um, yeah. Yes, and the slides will be shared on the YouTube site in one to two days. Uh, we have a question from Steven saying, timing of the land suitability maps. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I was talking to Monica about this earlier. And, you know, I think like the like next couple of months, uh, they're going to start releasing. I think chestnuts and apples are the first ones. Um, and then the rest of them kind of filtering through the year. Uh, but I don't want to make any commitments that I do not have to fulfill. So uh, I will retreat to, uh, you know, in, in the coming months. That's what I'll, I'll stick with. Keep checking back. Keep checking our website because they are really, really cool. Um, okay, so then I'll take the, the last three questions because we are running out of time. The first one is, are there any business plan examples available to us? Not on the Savannah Institute website. There are examples kind of in like, you know, SBA type, what, you know, small business administration websites. Um, uh, you know, there's, there are examples of that. I think organizations, you, know, you might look to some of these uh, other nonprofits that work in this land access space, uh, for examples. You know, a, a business plan is both, you know, very standard in its structure. You can find kind of templates for this online. Um, and really it's just you like writing out what you think is going to happen. Like, what is my marketing plan? You know, how, how not just like, you know, what's the market, but you know, what am I going to do to actually sell my products? You know, what is it about this land that makes my farming system work? Uh, what, how would I convince somebody that I know what I'm doing? Right. And so it's very, um, you know, very specific to, to, to your situation. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I also just linked farm commons, uh, their library of resources. That's a, it's a really great library. I'm not sure if they have business plans specifically, but they have a ton of other things, minimum wage, workers' compensation, insurance, all the other things that you need to know for this. Um, okay, how common is seller financing? Where can I find info to give to my landlord about this? I think seller financing is pretty common in the small world of like beginning farmers getting going, right? Because often the situation is a beginning farmer cannot get a bank loan. So I may be a landowner who wants to sell my land to this person who I think is going to do a good job and who I want to see succeed, but they cannot get a bank loan. So I have to do seller financing. Um, you know, and so that type of situation is not at all uncommon. Um, it depends on some situations. So like if the landowner has debt on the farm, they need at least enough of a down payment to pay off that debt so that they're not like sitting between their own bank and waiting for you to pay. And, and so depending on kind of what the ownership situation is, uh, seller financing may or may not be quite, quite as, as viable. Um, finding more information about it, the long-term lease workbook has some information about this. Uh, again, I think like Farm Commons, uh, the, and a number of those resources lists, I think go to like the Agrarian Trust link in the other resources slide. They had a whole list of, of things and, and, and you'll find information about seller financing there. Again, it's also called owner financing if you want to be, or land contracts, which again, I, there's a key difference there with the ownership. But if you just want to be looking around on the internet for, for stuff, those are the terms to look for couple of great resources that were just shared in the chat also. Paul Dietman, who we work with, um, he comes and speaks at a lot of our conferences. He will, he offered to share his email address where you can grab a simple business plan from him. And then Michael, one of our audience members, shared his business who, where he's also doing suitability maps. So check out the chat for those. I'm gonna read off one more question. Um, and then if your question wasn't answered today, please just email Patrick. Are four to seven percent interest rates reflective of market rates for agroforestry land acquisition and or capital investments for the farm? Before I get to that, I want to apologize for Paul to Paul for saying that banks were boring. Um, so uh, uh, four to seven percent interest rates. Uh, that's I think what what we what I've been seeing for land acquisition 
is like three and a half, four and a half percent is sort of like what's going on now, but that's very liable to change. Uh, through some of these um, like, you know, uh, dirt capital type organizations that like help invest in farmland and might invest in infrastructure as well. They look at like a 7% interest rate or somewhere in that neighborhood for uh, capital investments on the farm. Again, interest rates are very low right now. Um, and so these, you know, these numbers, like if you were talking to somebody in like the eighties farm crisis about this, they would have said like, what, you got 15% interest. How did you get it so low? Um, you know, but that was, again, it's called the farm crisis for a reason. Um, so, you know, I guess four to 7%, that's low. It's probably not going to go much lower than that. Um, but, uh, and, and it may go higher. It may, it may not ever go much lower than that. And it probably will be going higher in the future, but roughly today, I think that's what I've been, been seeing in conversations with, uh, lenders, financiers, et cetera. 